Είσοδος του Πρίτανη των Αντιπριτάνεων, του Κοσμήτωρα της Σχολής Οικονομικών Επιστημών, του Προέδρου και Καθηγητού του Τμήματος Οικονομικών Επιστημών του Οικονομικού Πανεπιστημίου Αθηνών. The Rector, the Vice Rector, the Dean of the School of Economic Sciences and the Head of the Department of Economics enter the hall. Κυρία Εκπρόσωπε του Προέδρου της Ελληνικής Κυβέρνησης, Πανοσιολογιότατη Εκπρόσωπε του Αρχιεπισκόπου Αθηνών και Πάσης Ελλάδος, κυρίου κυρίου Ιερονήμου. Κυρίες και κύριοι, καλώς ήρθατε στην απόψηνή μας τελετή αναγόρευσης. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear Professor Barrow, welcome to our conferment ceremony. Η σημερινή μας τελετή θα ξεκινήσει με προσφώνηση από τον Πρίτανη του Οικονομικού Πανεπιστημίου Αθηνών, καθηγητή κ. Δημήτριο Μπουραντώνη. Welcome address by the Rector of the University, Professor Δημήτριος Μπουραντώνης. Εκλεκτοί καλεσμένοι, κυρίες και κύριοι, αξιότιμοι καθηγητά κ. Μπάρο, με χαρά σας καλωσορίζω στην απόψινή τελετή αναγόρευσης. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear Professor Barrow, I would like to welcome you all to this conference ceremony. I'm truly honored to host, on behalf of the Athens University of Economics and Business, Professor Roberto, Robert Barrow, in order to award him the university's honorary doctoral degree in recognition of his outstanding scientific achievements in economics. Professor Robert Barrow is Paul Werberg, Professor of Economics at Harvard University, a visiting scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, and the Research Associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research. He holds a PhD in economics from Harvard University and a bachelor degree in physics from the California Institute of Technology. Professor Barrow is co-editor of Harvard's Quarterly Journal of Economics and has been president of the Western Economic Association and vice president of the American Economic Association. Research, research of Professor Barrow involves rare macroeconomic disasters, corporate tax reform, religion and economy, empirical determinants of economic growth and economic effects of public debt and budget deficits. His recent books include topics such as religion and economy, economic growth, economic ideas for the new millennium, determinants of economic growth, markets and choices in a free society. Before leaving the floor, I would like to add a line that today's ceremony signifies our university's continuous quest for scientific excellence. I would also wish to express my appreciation to Professor Barrow for accepting to be with us on this special day. Finally, I would like to thank you all for your presence this evening. Thank you very much. Welcome address by the head of the Department of Economics, Professor George Alagoskoufis. Distinguished guests, dear Rector, Professor Barrow, dear colleagues and students, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the staff and students of the Department of Economics at the Athens University of Economics and Business, it is my honor to welcome Professor Barrow to this award ceremony. Dear Professor Barrow, dear Robert, welcome to Greece, and many thanks for being here tonight to receive this award. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Professor Barrow 
has published groundbreaking papers in uh, leading academic journals on all areas of macroeconomics, including key papers on aggregate fluctuations under rational expectations, the role of monetary and fiscal policy, the determinants of long-run economic growth. His contributions in all those important areas are really innovative. He's one of the pioneers of explanations of the persistence of high inflation as a result of misguided attempts by central banks to keep unemployment below its natural rate, as well as the explanation of high public debt as a result of the partly justified reluctance of governments to raise tax rates in the presence of temporary rises in expenditure due to wars or deep recessions. Furthermore, his pioneering work on the determinants of economic growth have, uh, has helped us understand how differences in political and economic institutions, among others, help explain the large differences in the growth experience of various countries. And his most recent research focuses on the analysis of rare macroeconomic disasters, corporate tax reform, religion and the economy with Rachel McCleary, uh, while he continues working on the empirical determinants of economic growth and the determinants and economic effects of public debt and budget deficits. My colleague Vagelis Vasilatos will guide us through the intricacies of his many important contributions to macroeconomics. I first had the pleasure to interact with Professor Barrow in the late 1970s when my then thesis advisor at the London School of Economics, George Akerlof, advised me to write to him and ask for his recent unpublished work. He may not even remember that, but he was kind enough to, to send me a bunch of working papers through the post. This was, of course, before the internet, which were extremely helpful for my thesis research. And I have since been impressed both with his, by his scholarship, his dedication, and the versatility and quality of his research. Robert Barrow belongs to the top tier of economists worldwide who combine rigorous theory with applied empirical research in order to arrive at innovative and concrete conclusions and estimates, which can be a useful guide to policy. The interactions of theory and evidence, which are the hallmarks of his research, are key to a socially useful economics. Theory without evidence is of little more than intellectual interest, whereas Mere facts without an adequate theory are also of limited value. So the interaction of the two is what makes economics useful. And in this respect, Robert Barrow has been a masterful economist. The combination of the two is what allows economics to interpret the world around us and guide policymakers to adopt policies that can improve matters in the real world. Robert Barrow has made major contributions to macroeconomics in this spirit, and I would, say, I would dare say of Nobel Prize quality, and that is why his research is so important and socially relevant. In addition, Robert Barrow is an extremely dedicated teacher. Successive generations of students attest to that, as well as his two major textbooks, the pioneering undergraduate textbook Macroeconomics, based entirely on the intertemporal approach and micro foundations and his equally pioneering graduate textbook, Economic Growth, with Xavier Sala y Marta. We are more than happy to welcome him today in the family of distinguished honorary doctorate recipients of the Department of Economics at AUEB. Dear Robert, thank you for accepting this award. You are joining a distinguished group, uh, which includes the late James Tobin, Bob Lucas, Christopher Pisarides, John Giannakopoulos, Jean Tirol, Lars Peter Hansen, Richard Blandel, and Olivier Blanchard. Your addition to this group is an honor to us, and we look forward to your address and to future opportunities to interact with you as a member of our extended economic family. Thank you. Παρουσίαση του έργου του καθηγητή Robert Barrow από τον καθηγητή του Τμήματος Οικονομιστικής Επιστήμης, κ. Ευάγγελο Βασιλάτο. Presentation of Professor Robert Barrow's scientific work by the professor of the Department of Economics, Ευάγγελος Βασιλάτος. Okay.
Uh, distinguished guests, director, uh, thank you all for being here to honor Robert J. Barrow, uh, whose uh, work I will try to summarize in 10 minutes, which is something really difficult to do. So, uh, Robert Barrow is a leading American macroeconomist with uh, a really long and distinguished service to scholarship, teaching, and most important, the public policy debate. Barrow's work has been central to many of the economic and public policy debates of the last almost five decades, including business cycle theory, growth theory, the neoclassical synthesis, and public policy. He is the Paul Warburg Professor of Economics at Harvard University, and moreover, among others, he is a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences since 1988, uh, a distinguished fellow and past vice president of the American Economic Association, and until 2017, a senior fellow of the Hoover uh, Institution, Institution of Stanford University. Uh, in addition, he is co-editor of the Quarterly Journal of Economics and has served as an editor to major academic journals, such as the Journal of Political Economy, Econometrica, the American Economic Review, the Journal of Monetary Economics, the Journal of Economic Growth, and many others. Among his numerous and distinguished PhD students uh, are Svi Herkovic, Xavier Salai Martin, Xavier Gabe, Emi Nakamura, Michael Kremer, and last but not least, uh, a distinguished graduate of the Department of Economics uh, of the Athens University of Economics and Business, Mario Sageletos. Uh, he has authored literally hundreds uh, of research and policy papers and enjoys, I should have. Oh. Uh, supposedly everything I say should be uh, written on the, <laughs> on, the, on, the, on the slides, okay, so. But it doesn't work. Over there. So, until 2007, he was a senior fellow of the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. I don't think this is gonna work. <laughs> okay. Change it. Yeah, okay. So, uh, as I said before, he has authored hundreds of research and policy papers and enjoys thousands of scholar citations. Uh, no wonder the Research Papers in Economics project, the ubiquitous uh, REPEC, uh, currently ranks Robert uh, as the fifth most influential economist uh, in the world uh, based on his academic contributions. He also contributes frequently to public policy debate through his writings for the Wall Street Journal, uh, Business Week, and other popular media. Uh, Barrow's contributions to pedagogy include authoring the first undergraduate macroeconomics textbook to present, to present a neoclassical approach of the subject, focusing on the microeconomic foundations of macroeconomics, uh, since 1984, uh, and still uh, enjoying uh, its presence in major uh, universities, economics universities around the world. Uh, and. Uh, the widely used graduate level test on economic growth uh, in collaboration with Xavier Salai Martin. Uh, this 1984 macroeconomics textbook uh, remains a standard for explaining the subject, while his 1995 book with Xavier Salai Martin on economic growth is widely cited and read uh, as a graduate level textbook on the theory and evidence concerning long run economic growth. Barrow graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Physics from the California Institute of Technology in 1965, uh, and then turned to economics and earned a PhD from Harvard University in uh, 1970. Uh, his supervisor was Grilichis. And coming now to research. Barrow is one of the founders of the new classical school of macroeconomic thought as well as the modern theory of public finance uh, since the 70s, and has contributed consistently to both theoretical and methodological advances, as well as public policy applications ever since. 
Barrow's contribution is substantial and multifaceted. And here I can focus on just a handful of his seminal contributions that have gained universal exposure beyond the limits of the academia. First and foremost, Barrow has contributed substantially to the analysis of fiscal policy, showing how his, its macroeconomic implications can be analyzed within a, a general equilibrium neoclassical framework encompassing the modern theory of public finance. Uh, Rigorously. <laughs> okay. So, uh, as I said before, uh, I will start with uh, a handful. I will present a handful uh, of his uh, of seminar papers, well uh, known even beyond the academia. Let's start with uh, his paper, "Are Government Bonds Net, Net Wealth?" from 1974. Uh, this paper originated the modern literature on Ricardian equivalence, showing that under certain assumptions, changes in the level of public debt have no macroeconomic consequences at all, since the wealth effects of people's holdings of such debt are offset by the anticipated future taxes required to pay off the debt. In other words, present governmental borrowing is matched by increased bequests to future generations to pay future taxes in order to pay down the government bonds. Thus, a lowering of current taxes financed by the issue of government bonds would have no effect on the public spending on consumer goods. This paper is among the most cited in macroeconomics and remains central to modern uh, ana uh, economic analysis both in the academia, in the academic circles, and policy-making circles. Another seminal paper from, the, from 1979, this time, uh, is the paper on the determination of public debt. Uh, in which he argued for uh, the optimality of a state contingent path for public debt that allows for intertemporal smoothing of tax distortions, one of the most celebrated results in the normative theory of fiscal policy. Uh, the term tax smoothing is familiar to all students of economics um, and not only students. Among his contributions to monetary economics, his papers with David Gordon from 1983 on rules uh, versus discretion and reputation, uh, presented one of the most influential analysis of the inflationary bias that can result from a purely discretionary approach to the conduct of monetary policy. More specifically, he applied the information asymmetry argument to the role of central banks and concluded that central, blank, central blank banks in order to have credibility in inflation fighting, they must be committed uh, into inflation targets that they cannot violate, however noble the temptation to do so. That paper provided a key argument for the value of commitment to an explicit inflation target, an approach, an approach that gained popularity worldwide thereafter, and this beyond the limits of monetary policy as well. In fact, these papers formalize the benefits of policy rules and have been used in various contexts since then. For example, the, fiscal, the introduction of uh, fiscal rules related to the uh, Eurozone membership requirements is such an example. Barrow's research in the 90s uh, was focused mainly on the theoret theoretical and empirical determinants of growth uh, and he gave uh, fundamental contributions to the theory of endogenous growth with particular attention to the links between innovation and public investment on one side and growth on the other side. This gave birth to one of the workhorse models of uh, modern macroeconomics, the so-called uh, gene the production function model. <clears throat> 
Uh, he also was a pioneer in the econometric analysis of the main factors associated with growth in the modern era. It is also worth noting uh, the empirical studies on the effects of fiscal policy and especially the effect of government pur purchases on aggregate government activity. Among his numerous other contribution, uh, contributions, I mention only in brief, first of all, his very early work with Herschel Grossman on a general disequilibrium, disequilibrium model of income and employment that explored the idea that disequilibrium in, in one market can have spillover effects to other markets, creating a distinction between what we call notional de demand and uh, juxtaposed to effective demand. In the mid-70s, he also focused on rational expectations and the role of monetary policy, with this work being important in integrating the role of money into neoclassical economics and into the synthesis of general equilibrium and macroeconomic models. Another strand of his research, interest in collaboration this time with Gary Becker, relates to fertility, leading to a much cited body of work which is influential in thinking about what infinite time horizon modeling is all about. Recently, his research interests include investigating in collaboration, in collaboration with Rachel McCleary the influence of religion on political economy. And another issue that appears in his research, recent research activity is the role that awareness of the possibility of infrequent but catastrophic risks may play in explaining the prices of long-lived assets. Last but not least, it is worth mentioning his very recent papers on uh, the COVID crisis. As I mentioned earlier, Barrow's work has been central to many of the economic and public policy debates of the last 40 plus years including business cycle theory, growth theory, the neoclassical synthesis and public policy. But why has his work been so influential over the year? One can think of many, many reasons. Okay, running quickly this time. So, uh, first of all, his work consists of an excellent mix of rigorous theory and applied work and policy that brings cl clarity to both theory and policy. His analysis is built, is built upon solid workhorse macro models, which taking into account the data, X uh, this is X files. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, so his analysis is built upon solid workers macro models, which taking into account the data, that is what is happening in the real world, are based on rigorous and logical assumptions, and through consistent argumentation, they lead us to logical, rational, and consistent conclusions. Also, he has the talent, and this is a real talent, so if somebody is uh, trying to interfere, okay. <laughs> So, oh, so, also he has the talent to identify big questions and give solid answers. This is a real talent. Not many people have this talent to do so. And thus, last but not least, he contributes to dialogue and debates in policy. In other words, Barrow's work presents for all of us, laymen, professional, academic, policymakers, politicians, a most important challenge. They make us think, they make us organize our thoughts, ponder on all these issues that affect our everyday life and well-being, and providing this way a solid <coughs> and internally consistent framework of analysis. And this is very important. Uh, it is very important to start thinking about so important issues, having a rigorous framework to do so. One may agree or disagree with the stance taken by Robert when it comes to the policy debate, but the discussion will always be sound, rigorous, 
no nonsense, interesting, and eventually fruitful. So, thank you, first of all, you. Thank you, Robert, for all this body of work that uh, we enjoy reading and uh, follows our uh, academic career all this year. And you for listening to me. Αναγόρεση του τιμόμενου καθηγητή ως επίτιμου διδάκτορα του Τμήματος Οικονομικής Επιστήμης της Σχολής Οικονομικών Επιστημών του Οικονομικού Πανεπιστημίου Αθηνών. Conferment of Doctorate Honoris Causa on Professor Robert Barrow. Ανάγνωση του κειμένου του ψηφίσματος από τον πρόεδρο του Τμήματος Οικονομικής Επιστήμης, καθηγητή κ. Γεώργιο Λαγοσκούφη. The head of the department, Professor Georgia Λαγοσκούφη, reads the conferment resolution as adopted by the, by the university's Department of Economics. Robert, I apologize, you will not understand any of this. <laughs> I have to read in Greek. Sifisma, to the Department of Economics of the School of Economics of the University of the Βρυτανεύοντος εν το Αθήνησιν Οικονομικό Πανεπιστημίο καθηγητού Δημητρίου Χαραλάβους Μπουραντώνη, κοσμητεύοντας τη Σχολή Οικονομικών Επιστημών καθηγητού Θωμά Αποστόλου Μούτου, προεδρεύοντος του Τμήματος Οικονομικής Επιστήμης καθηγητού Γεωργίου Σπυρίδωνος Αλογοσκούφη, έδοξεν ομοθήμος το τμήματι, επιδίπερ ο Ρόμπερτ Τζέι Μπάρο, ανήρ επιφανής, Εξηνωμένων Πολιτιών Αμερικής Ορμόμενος, καθηγητής του Πανεπιστημίου Χάρβαρντ, προήγαγε την επιστήμην εποφελία των γενήν εν των ανθρώπων κοινωνία κατεπιχειρουμένων, αυτόν επενέσε και του Τμήματος Οικονομικής Επιστήμης επίτιμον διδάκτορα αναδείξε. Το δε ψήφισμα τόδε, εις μεμβράναν αναγράψε και του Προέδρου του Τμήματος εν τη μεγάλη αναγνώντος αυτό επιδούνε ή αν η μέρα η αναγόρευσης γέννητο, καθάνε νόμιστε, εγένε το Αθήνησιν μηνός Ιουνίου τη 8η, έτη Δευτέρο και 20ο και της χιλιοστό από Χριστού Γεννήσεως. Ο πρόεδρος του Τμήματος Οικονομικής Επιστήμης, καθηγητής Γιώργος Αλογοσκούφης. Ανάγνωση του κειμένου της αναγόρευσης από τον Πρίτανη καθηγητή Δημήτριο Μπουραντώνη. The Rector, Professor Δημήτριος Μπουραντώνης, reads the pronouncement. Αναγόρευσης, τύχη αγαθή, επειδή υπέρ το Τμήμα Οικονομικής Επιστήμης της Σχολής Οικονομικών Επιστημών, προεδρεύοντος του καθηγητού Γεωργίου Σπυρίδωνος Αλαγουσκούφη, τον Ρόβερτ Τζέι Μπάρο, άξιον απέφυνε του επιτίμου διδακτορικού διπλώματος διατάφτα εγώ, Δημήτριος Χαραλάμπους Μπουραντώνης, καθηγητής του Τμήματος Διεθνών και Ευρωπαϊκών Οικονομικών Σπουδών, νυν δε του Πανεπιστημίου Τούτου Πρίτανης, χρώμενος στη δυνάμη, ειν παρά των Πανεπιστημιακών Νόμων Ήλυφα, τον Ρόμπερτ Τζέι Μπάρο, επίτιμο διδάκτορα του Τμήματος Οικονομικής Επιστήμης της Σχολής Οικονομικών Επιστημών του Οικονομικού Πανεπιστημίου Αθηνών, δημοσίως αναγορεύω και πάντα τα προνόμια, τα το πανεπιστημιακό τούτο αξιώματι παρεπόμενα από νέμο, εγένετο, Αθήνηση μηνός Ιουνίου, τη 8η έτη Δευτέρω και 20 και δυσκλειστό από Χριστού Γεννήσεως, ο Πρίτανης καθηγητής Δημήτριος Χαραλάβης Κουραντώνης. Ανάγνωση του κειμένου του επίτιμου διδακτορικού διπλώματος από τον κοσμήτορα της Σχολής Οικονομικών Επιστημών, καθηγητή Θωμά Μούτο. The Dean of the School of Economic Sciences, Professor Thomas Μούτος, reads the award. Ελληνική Δημοκρατία, επίτιμων διδακτορικών δίπλωμα, πριτανεύοντος εν το Αθήνησιν Οικονομικό Πανεπιστημίου, καθηγητού Δημητρίου Χαραλάμπους Μπουραντώνη, κοσμητεύοντος εν τη Σχολή Οικονομικών Επιστημών, καθηγητού Θωμά Αποστόλου Μούτου, προεδρεύοντος του Τμήματος Οικονομικής Επιστήμης, καθηγητού Γεωργίου Σπυρίδωνος Αλογοσκούφη. Ο Ρόμπερτ Τζέι Μπάρο, 
γεννηθείς εν έτη τετάρτο και τεσσαρακοστό και εννεακοσιωστό και χιλιοστό από Χριστού Γεννήσεως, καθηγητής του Πανεπιστημίου Χάρβαρτ, εξηνωμένων πολιτιών Αμερικής ορμόμενος, από δόγματος ομοθήμου του Οικονομικού Πανεπιστημίου Αθηνών, επίτιμος διδάκτορο του Τμήματος Οικονομικής Επιστήμης της Σχολής Οικονομικών Επιστημών Ενεκρίθη. Εγένετο Αθήνησιν, μηνός Ιουνίου τη 8η, έτη Δευτέρο και 20 και δυσχυλιαστό από Χριστού Γεννήσεως. Ο πρόεδρος του τμήματος, καθηγητής Γεώργιος Αλογοσκούφης, ο κοσμήτορ της σχολής, καθηγητής Θωμάς Μούτος, ο πρίτανης, καθηγητής Δημήτριος Μπουραντώνης. Παρακαλείται ο καθηγητής Ρόμπερτ Μπάρο να προσέλθει. Professor Robert Barrow is kindly requested to proceed. Ομιλία του θυμόμενου. Keynote speech delivered by Professor Robert Barrow entitled The Return of Inflation. So it's a great honor for me to be here for this event. And it's particularly a pleasure because I'm accompanied by my wife, Rachel, and our son, Zach, and his girlfriend, Alexandra. And this will be part of a touristic trip for us to see things in Athens and elsewhere in Greece. So I wanted to say some words today about uh, inflation. I think it might be fair to say inflation has become the number one macroeconomic topic these days. That's a little surprising because there was a period of several decades under which inflation had gotten to be very low and stable and it was regarded as a solved problem. And now it doesn't seem to be the case. One also would have thought given how long economists have spent studying inflation in the past, that it would be an issue well understood by macroeconomists in general. And also I would hope that I would understand this topic. I'm not sure either of these things are actually correct in terms of the understanding. And uh, I will try to talk about that today and maybe you can see what you think. Thinking about inflation, I think it's natural to start with the famous quote from Milton Friedman, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. It comes from 1963. 
and it amounts to the statement that inflation results from too much money chasing too few goods. And you can think about this proposition from the point of view of the famous quantity theory of money. Uh, it's the only equation I have in my talk today. Uh, MV equals PQ. Uh, so if you think about Q as something like the real gross domestic uh, product, um, PQ, P is the price level, PQ is the total amount of uh, expenditure, if you like, that's being carried out via money. And velocity V is the ratio of that expenditure to the quantity of money, which is M. And the standard view, uh, which is required to get uh, Milton Friedman's view on this whole topic, is that velocity of money uh, is related to the demand for money, and that's assumed to be a reasonably stable function. It might depend on things like interest rates and the level of real GDP, but it's supposed to be uh, uh, a stable function. It doesn't move around uh, a lot. Okay, so I'm gonna focus this discussion on a familiar modern system, which is about money being pieces of paper, which has no intrinsic value. So I'm not talking about the gold standard, commodity standards. Uh, those systems are kind of easy to comprehend as to how they uh, would seem to work. It's paper money that's really confusing, actually, even though it's also very uh, familiar. So if you think about uh, basically the real economy determining the real GDP, the Q in the uh, quantity equation that I uh, had before, uh, the quantity theory basically proposes a mapping between the path of money, monetary aggregates, the M, today's money, maybe future money, and the price level, which then determines the inflation rate over time. So somehow, the way you determine the quantity of money, that determines uh, the price level and inflation, which is a very simple kind of uh, proposition. Now, it might involve some tricky dynamics involving what happens along the way to expected future inflation. That's this thing I call pi e here. Uh, something about how real GDP is determined. Uh, something about the demand for money, which comes into play in velocity. Uh, but basically, it's a thesis that the quantity of money, which is maybe determined by the uh, central bank, uh, is inevitably going to determine the price level and inflation. And that's what the theory uh, uh, comes down to. Now, I think in practice, particularly as you uh, look at time evolving and going up to the modern period, uh, velocity, in fact, becomes very unstable. And related to that is that the real demand for money is not really easy to write down as a stable function of something uh, uh, simple. And if the demand for money is moving around a lot, it doesn't really work very well to think about determining inflation just by determining the quantity of money. That doesn't actually work if the demand for money is moving all over the place. Uh, instead, in that system, what you really want to do is allow the quantity of money uh, nominal monetary aggregates of some sort to basically adjust endogenously given what the price level is doing. It's sort of turning things on its head. And uh, somehow you're doing something that determines the price level and in inflation. And then money is all adjusting uh, endogenously within the system. It's not the way Milton Friedman talked about this problem uh, uh, at all. Uh, one simple example of this is the seasonal pattern that's been present in the quantity of various monetary aggregates for a long time, and it actually makes a lot of sense. You'll let the quantity of money in, uh, adjust over the seasons so that you don't have to have a lot of seasonal pattern in prices and interest rates. Uh, that's a very familiar pattern, but it sort of exemplifies this uh, uh, situation. I think in modern times, there's really uh, a, a, the lack of a well-defined demand for any kind of uh, nominal monetary aggregate that you usually think about. You can think about the monetary base, uh, 
which is predominantly reserves held at a central bank, but also includes currency. Or you can think about uh, what used to be called M1 and M2, uh, which add various kinds of deposits to things like currency. People don't even talk anymore about M1 and M2 and uh, these kinds of monetary aggregates, so it used to be very uh, uh, familiar. But in fact, the demand for any of these is very poorly defined and basically moves around uh, uh, tremendously. Now, because of that situation, uh, at least in an environment before relatively recently when nominal interest rates were typically positive, not being close uh, to zero, um, central banks, including the Federal Reserve in the United States, have focused on moving around the interest rate, usually some kind of short-term nominal interest rate, to influence the price level and thereby inflation. And monetary uh, system has been characterized in terms of adjusting interest rates uh, to accomplish this, not in terms of particularly moving uh, around monetary aggregates. That's not been the centerpiece. Uh, the quantity of money then adjusts in some kind of endogenous fashion, given what the central bank is doing with respect to uh, uh, interest rates. And this system in the United States, I'm going to focus here now a lot on the uh, US monetary policy. Uh, at least if you go back to uh, Federal Reserve Chair Volcker, and shortly after he came into office in the early 1980s, uh, he focused on doing things with in, uh, interest rates to accomplish uh, a reduction of inflation, which had become very high through the 1970s. So uh, his approach was to do something with respect to interest rates to bring inflation down dramatically. That's, that's what he was uh, centered on. Um, that Volcker-like response has become entrenched in terms of what now usually is referred to as some kind of inflation targeting. Inflation targeting means that you look at what's going on with inflation, you react to that in terms of your primary monetary instrument, which is about interest rates, nominal interest rates, particularly short-term ones, uh, and that kind of reaction is referred to as some kind of inflation targeting uh, regime. Um, New Zealand was the first to implement that in a very formal manner in the late 1980s, but it became pronounced in uh, uh, basically all the leading uh, countries of the world. Um, this kind of response has been formalized in terms of what's called uh, a Taylor rule after the economist uh, John uh, Taylor. Uh, specifying a way to adjust interest rates in response to what's going on in the economy, particularly with regard to inflation, but also including real variables such as the uh, unemployment rate. Uh, an important feature of the Taylor rule is what's called the Taylor principle, which is if you see what's going on with inflation, you're going to adjust nominal interest rates. So if inflation goes up, you're going to adjust nominal interest rates upward and furthermore, you're going to do it more than one to one in order to get real interest rates to go up when there's inflation. And then the thesis is that higher real interest rates, by curtailing economic activity perhaps, are going to, is going to accomplish what you wanted, which was reducing inflation. So if inflation is high, you adjust interest rates up, but you do it more than one to one to get the real interest rate rising and that's supposed to bring inflation uh, back down. Uh, it's a little unclear exactly over what horizon you're supposed to be doing this. Uh, that might leave too much latitude for what monetary policy can accomplish. But in any case, this principle has been violated dramatically over the last couple of years. Uh, so if I focus on the United States, which has experienced more inflation than some other rich countries, uh, inflation has gone up to something like 8% uh, a year of late, and interest rates didn't budge at all until relatively recently, and when they've gone up, they've gone up by much less than inflation. So it's completely violating the uh, traditional Taylor rule in the terms of this particular this Taylor uh, uh, principle. So if I go back to Volcker, 
which I think of as the hero of this story when I tell stories related to this. Uh, in the early 1980s, the way he tamed high and vol uh, volatile inflation was basically by committing to moving interest rates in a manner uh, of whatever it takes to bring inflation down, to make inflation be low and stable. And that view, and the reason I used the term whatever it takes, was reprised uh, in 2012 by Mario Draghi when he was head of the European Central Bank in terms of what he was going to do to maintain the euro as a uh, system of currency and exchange rate. And he said he would do whatever it takes. So he was committing something. And I think he had in mind what Volcker had done uh, some 30 years earlier with respect to conquering inflation, particularly in the United States. Um, it was remarkable how successful the Volcker experiment was in the early 1980s. Uh, interest rates went up, nominal short-term rates, to about 20%, which of course is staggering compared with recent uh, experience, um, contributed clearly to an economic downturn, and Volcker was supported by the president, who was then Reagan, even though Volcker had been appointed by his predecessor, Carter. Uh, but it was important, I think, that Volcker had support from the administration at the time because it was politically difficult to be enduring a recession and that uh, Volcker thought we had to pay this price to be committed to low and stable inflation. And it was amazing how well it worked because inflation actually came down very rapidly even though beforehand uh, economists had all said it was impossible to bring inflation down so quickly. And expected inflation fell along with it and then from the early 1980s until relatively recently, I would say until 2020, uh, the system in the US and in many other countries was basically anchored by the expectation of low inflation, around 2% per year. And somehow, almost no matter what happened over that uh, period of 30 to 40 years, uh, expected inflation became anchored at a low level because people apparently became convinced that the monetary authority would do whatever it took to restore inflation to a low rate if it was going up. That was the Volcker uh, contribution, I believe. Um, but people also became complacent about this situation. People basically got used to it and thought that this would always work. Now, in particular, low inflation around 2% per year as, as an average, uh, worked even with the uh, Great Recession financial crisis, uh, particularly 2008, 2009, and this was when Ben Bernanke was uh, chair of the Federal uh, uh, Reserve. Um, so he had this dramatic reaction to the financial crisis, including the Lehman bankruptcy. Um, and part of what he did was to bring uh, short-term nominal interest rates down to uh, uh, basically zero, which was quite a novel thing uh, uh, at the time. He also introduced this vast quantitative easing, <coughs> which particularly applied once interest rates had gotten extremely low, maybe zero, and then it was hard to go very much below zero. So he instead uh, implemented various stages of this quantitative easing where the Federal Reserve bought a lot of stuff uh, in exchange for issuing a form of money which is reserves held at the Federal uh, Reserve. Uh, so the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve in this period went up from about $1 trillion, these days you might say merely $1 trillion, uh, to about 3 to $4 trillion, which was uh, quite unprecedented at the time. Uh, so it looked like Bernanke was having a tremendous uh, monetary expansion. It looked like monetary policy was extremely expansionary at this time in response to the uh, Great Recession, 2008, 2009. But remarkably, inflation stayed at around 2% per year. It didn't really budge hardly. And I must say, uh, I was surprised by this at the time. I thought that inflation was going to go up at that time because I thought, uh, like Milton Friedman had told me, with uh, 
you would get inflation when you had too much money chasing too few goods. Uh, but it didn't happen, right? Inflation stayed uh, pretty well anchored along with expected inflation. Uh, now, one thing that I think is true, and another thing that Bernanke implemented was paying interest on reserves that financial institutions held at the central bank. Now, in this setup, I'm pretty sure that quantitative easing is actually very unimportant. This is not what Bernanke believes. Bernanke just came out with a book recently, talks a lot about quantitative easing. Uh, he thinks it's important. Uh, he thinks it's something that works in practice, but not in theory. And I don't think that that's right. I don't think it's certainly right that it uh, works in theory, and I don't think it works in practice either. Uh, but the reason I think that is because in this situation, if you think about the uh, central bank printing money, basically creating reserves held at the bank, like the Federal Reserve, and using that to buy US Treasury bills, that is very short-term government paper, uh, those things are essentially perfect substitutes. Uh, and that's true going back to this 2008 until now. Those things are basically the same. You can hold a, a three-month treasury bill, and it's pay, uh, been paying a very low interest rate, particularly uh, before the last uh, uh, several months. And you can hold reserves at the uh, central bank, and it basically pays the same thing. And these things are really perfect substitutes. So I think quantitative easing, where the central bank uh, ends up holding short-term government paper, shouldn't matter, and I think, in fact, it doesn't matter. So that's where I uh, deviate from what Bernanke uh, has been uh, saying. Now, in practice, the central bank doesn't hold only short-term treasury bills. Uh, so in particular, they might hold long-term treasuries or long-term government bonds more generally. Well, then quantitative easing in that form might matter a little bit. It basically amounts to raising the duration of the public debt that's outstanding, basically shifting around from short-term uh, treasury bills to longer-term government bonds. Uh, and you, the, the central bank is affecting the uh, maturity composition of the debt that's held outside of the central bank. Uh, this was actually the subject of the PhD thesis that Marios Angelitos did at Harvard after he left this uh, institution. And it certainly might matter what the uh, maturity distribution is of the public debt, but I don't think it matters very much for inflation. I think it matters for other things perhaps, but it doesn't matter that much, and I don't think it matters much for inflation. <coughs> Now, it's also true that some parts of quantitative easing uh, involve the central bank holding other types of paper. So in the US, the thing that was really important in this 2008 period was mortgage-backed securities, because in particular, the recession had to do with a housing crisis and with all kinds of funny paper related to mortgages. And the Federal Reserve was trying to help that by specifically buying up that type of paper. Uh, so they would issue money, reserves at the bank, uh, but what they would hold to some extent was not U.S. government bonds, but rather they would hold uh, mortgage-backed securities, uh, which were predominantly privately issued. Uh, other central banks might hold other things, so you might uh, extend this analysis, although it's not so important for the Federal Reserve. Now, if the, if the central bank decides to buy up a lot of mortgage-related paper, that might also matter for something. It might matter for the mortgage market. It might matter for housing. Again, I don't think it matters very much for inflation, which is what I was trying to talk about here. So in the end, my conclusion is that quantitative easing probably is not so important. So even though the central bank's balance sheet went up from one trillion to four trillion in this period, up to 2010, basically. Um, it may not be surprising, at least in retrospect, that that was not inflationary, is what I'm trying to argue. Um, I haven't discussed this with Bernanke. I should talk to him about this. But uh, I'm pretty sure from his book that he would not agree with this uh, uh, approach. So I'm trying to explain why is it that US inflation 
stayed low on the order of 2% per year, even though there was a, this apparent vastly expansionary monetary policy at the time, including this new implementation of quantitative easing. I'm trying to explain, at least in retrospect, why maybe it's not so surprising that inflation did not go up. I, again, I started by saying I was surprised at the time. I thought this policy would be inflationary. Um, well, the important thing now is to compare this with the current situation. You had a COVID recession and you had monetary policy. Here you had this great recession and you had monetary policy. Monetary policy was vastly expansionary in both cases. You've had inflation recently, but not before. And I'm trying to understand why. What was the difference? And I'm not sure I'm going to give you an answer, but that's what I'm trying to think about here. Now, one thing Bernanke did was to drive interest rates down to zero in, in the wake of the financial crisis. And I have no quarrel with that. I think this was really a very uh, dangerous situation and this response, I think, was reasonable. The real question is what happened after the uh, recession was finished. So if you look from 2010 on, particularly 2011 on, and Bernanke was head of the Federal Reserve until early 2014, the question is, why did they not go back to a normal situation where interest rates were 2, 3, 4 percent rather than zero? And interest rates, in fact, stayed at zero throughout Bernanke's term. And the question is, why didn't he restore uh, the situation to normalcy? And I think this was a great mistake. But if you read his book, he talks about why didn't they do it? And it's basically a central banker is going to decide, well, I want to keep the expansionary situation here with zero nominal interest rates. I'm going to look around and I'm going to find some excuse for doing that. That's how it reads to me. And basically what Bernanke says is, well, there's an economic recovery, but it's not that strong. And it's particularly not that strong in the labor market and the unemployment rate is still 8% or something, depending on which year we're, we're talking about. Uh, so he comes up with a series of reasons to explain why he didn't restore the situation to normalcy. I don't find it all that convincing. But then that was continued in 2014 when Janet Yellen, who's now the Treasury Secretary, became chair of the Fed. That was in 2014, following on for uh, Bernanke. And she basically continued with the policy that he had in place, which was Interest rate is always zero, basically. Uh, so Janet engineered one minor increase in the interest rate uh, toward the end of her term in office in 2018. Uh, but basically what's true, which is quite remarkable, is that the nominal interest rate was kept at zero for 10 years, starting in 2008 during the financial crisis and then for the next 10 years. So that I find quite remarkable. Question is then why did inflation not go up, given that apparently there was this very expansionary monetary policy? So these are some speculative uh, responses to that. First one is that going back to Volcker, the central bank had established this reputation for maintaining low and stable inflation. And that corresponded to expected inflation being anchored at a low level. And somehow that was so strong that it was kept in place even though the central bank had this very expansionary monetary policy. So that's something about expected inflation being low and that helped to keep actual inflation low. The second point, which I tried to make before, is that quantitative easing, even though it was vast, doesn't really matter much. And I think that's correct, actually. But that helps to explain why we didn't have uh, inflation. But again, I have this last point. Uh, I had not expected the outcome where inflation didn't go up in the period from 2010, 2012, 2014. And I'm going to return to that uh, in a moment in the context of the current situation. Okay, so Janet uh, Yellen was replaced by uh, Powell in 2014. And 
Powell, uh, after a while, tried to raise nominal interest rates back up to what was viewed as a more normal level. So he got up as high as 2.5% by 2019 when he was in office. It was a slow pace of increase of uh, interest rates. And then the economy was hit by the COVID recession in spring 2020, particularly April 2020. And as I think is well known, there was an enormous downturn uh, expressed at an annual rate. It was completely unprecedented in terms of how fast, particularly the US economy declined more or less through a voluntary shutdown of economic activity in response to the pandemic. Okay, so the Federal Reserve returned to the kind of expansionary policies that Bernanke had put in place for the previous recession. Interest rates immediately went back down to zero, even though they hadn't gotten up very high anyhow. They were only about two, two and a half percent. But quantitative easing was now put in place in a magnitude which made the previous uh, experience look like a minor event. So now the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve has gone up to nine trillion. I thought three to four trillion was incredible at the time. Uh, but now, and it's still true today, the balance sheet is up to nine trillion. So in comparison, the US GDP is about 20, 21 trillion. So if you think about it, the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve being $9 trillion, obviously that's not a minor uh, amount. Now Powell is a good central banker. He really didn't want to do something that was contractionary. He didn't want to raise interest rates. And that was true even when inflation began to rise, which hadn't been true for decades. So inflation started to go up particularly toward the end of 2020. I think it's already in, in, in effect in the end of 2020. And I was already worried about the return of inflation at that point. But Powell came up with a sequence of excuses not to respond by raising interest rates. Uh, so there was this famous vision of inflation merely being <coughs> transitory, so you didn't have to do anything. Uh, he put in this new form of monetary policy, modifying the Taylor rule, so that you only have to adjust with a lag to inflation because you looked at some kind of average inflation. He entertained the idea of a different definition of inflation. Basically, he came up with everything you could to come up with the answer you wanted anyhow, which was don't raise interest rates. And that's what he was doing for quite some time. Now, I think the failure of monetary policy to react accumulating over this period from late 2020 to very recently has basically destroyed the reputation that was built up by Volcker so long ago, which showed up as low expected inflation and that somehow the central bank would do whatever it needed to do to keep that in place. I think that in, uh, reputation is now gone and expected inflation has, has gone up. And this is a problem because inflation has real costs and many people are worrying about them now. Um, there's this threat of stagflation in terms of high inflation being accompanied by worsening real economic activity, perhaps a new recession. I think these are legitimate uh, uh, worries. Uh, one particular problem I have going back to the 1970s is that to try to conquer inflation Instead of doing something serious, the government will resort again to price controls. And I would not be surprised to see uh, a movement in that general direction. And as we know from the past, these kinds of interventions are more costly than open inflation, which is also costly. Oops. I have to get back. Okay, so I think what the uh, U.S. government needs, in particular the central bank, the Federal Reserve, is a new credible chair of the Fed who's somebody who looks as much as possible like Paul Volcker. Now instead, Powell has recently been reappointed to a new four-year term. And frankly, anyway, even if the administration had decided to have a new chair of the Fed, I doubt that they would have settled on somebody who would really be better than Powell. So it probably didn't make any difference that he was uh, uh, reappointed. 
Given this environment, I find it very surprising how little criticism there has been of Chair Powell, given how much I think he's damaged the reputation of the central bank. I think he hasn't had that much criticism up till now, even though it started uh, uh, a bit. If you look at periods where there was criticism in the past of uh, Federal Reserve chairs, well, you find it particularly for G. William Miller, who was uh, Carter's first choice to be chair of the Fed, it, and he was basically kicked out in 1979. This was under Carter. And one thing that I'd forgotten is he wasn't completely fired. What he was actually done to was he was promoted to be secretary of the treasury. But he was basically kicked upstairs to get him out of what was a more important position in fact, which was Federal Reserve Chair. And that left the room for Volcker to be appointed uh, to move over from being president of the New York Federal Reserve Bank. Um, so I thought that would be a brilliant move today. Uh, I don't think Janet Yellen's been very effective at Treasury Secretary, so you could move her out, you could move Powell into that position come up with a serious person to be chair of the Fed, that would be brilliant, but I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, the other Fed chair who was very much criticized was Arthur Burns, who supported the price controls that Nixon put in in the 1970s. Uh, but beyond that, there hasn't been that much criticism. And I'm trying to say that I'm ambivalent about Bernanke, because I think he did some very good things as chair of the Fed. But in the end, I think he made a big mistake by not restoring the reputation by moving things back to a normal uh, environment. Okay, so here's a question I have which I'd really like to understand. And I mean this seriously, like, uh, I don't think I understand this, and it's not that I think I understand less than other macroeconomists, I think it's something that's not well understood. Uh, so why do we have inflation now, which is very high, in the last year plus, following the COVID recession, but we didn't have it in 2010 and years after that, following the Great Recession with the financial crisis? Why is it different? I think that's central to understanding monetary policy. But the funny thing is that monetary policies in the two periods look similar. They both feature movements down to zero nominal interest rates. They both feature vast quantitative easing. This is again from the US perspective. We could talk other places, but I think you're gonna get a similar kind of vision. Monetary policies look similar and both periods feature highly expansionary monetary policy. But you had inflation now, you didn't have it uh, in the period 10 years ago. Well, Bernanke in his book focuses on the fact that the economic recovery was not so rapid. And if you look at the period recently, you had this tremendous downturn, but a very brief one, more or less a voluntary closure of the economy. And given that that's what's happened, it's not too surprising that you had a sharp V-shaped recovery because you basically stopped closing things down in a voluntary fashion. So you had a tremendous recovery toward the end of 2020 into 2021 in the real economy. Now in contrast, in the earlier period, you had a recovery that was occurring more or less uh, regularly, but it wasn't as rapid as Bernanke thought he wanted it to be. Um, I don't think that the differences in the pace of the two economic recoveries uh, are the reason that you had inflation recently, but not in the previous uh, period. You could think about maybe that's why, but I don't think that's the right uh, explanation. What I think is the biggest difference, and it's not that I know this for sure, but I, I think it's where the difference really lies, is the extraordinary fiscal expansion that's occurred again, particularly in the United States, but also uh, other places, uh, in response to the COVID recession. There's been a basically complete abandonment of fiscal discipline. Now, some of the blame for this is from the former President Trump, who didn't really care at all about fiscal discipline. But that was completely uh, uh, dominated by what occurred in 2021 
when there was an expansion in terms of transfer payments from the government, which had never been seen before. And that completely dwarfs what Trump did uh, in the earlier period. But in some sense, they're reinforcing in terms of lack of fiscal discipline coming from the government. Uh, because where maybe traditionally you had one side, the Democrats not caring about fiscal di discipline, being offset by the Republicans, but now they were all on the same page, and, in, and that page was a tremendous fiscal expansion. So I think that might be the main difference between the recent period, and in particular the one that uh, Bernanke was involved with in 2010. And this is sometimes expressed as a model that I never have quite understood, which is called the fiscal theory of the price level, which is supposed to be some alternative to the monetary model that Milton Friedman uh, uh, emphasized. So what matters in that approach is two things. The total nominal net obligations of the government, not particularly money, but the total nominal obligations in a net sense, which mostly government bonds, along with the prospective path of future primary deficits. Um, according to this theory, the price level adjusts so that the government's budget constraint works over time. And basically, the way the government gets revenue when it needs it is to have a higher price level, which reduces the real value of its obligations. And that maybe maps into a theory about what the price level has to be and what the inflation rate has to be corresponding to it. But I don't understand this uh, fully. But I think this might be a better theory about why we have inflation now and why we didn't have it in 2010. So let me try to finish this up with what I think is the mystery of inflation. If you think about a paper money system, which is what all the major economies have, uh, it's really a great mystery about how do you determine the price level. Because right? money is just some made up piece of paper. And the price level tells you how many pieces of paper you need to buy real stuff. And you might have thought that it's very hard to figure that out. And then it might be mysterious. What's the price level? And correspondingly, what's the inflation rate? It might be something very mysterious in the sense, instead of being something very uh, ordinary and easy to understand. There's, basic, there's no intrinsic value for paper money, which makes it different from a commodity standard, which I, of course I haven't been talking about and which we haven't seen in the world for a long time. Uh, there's no stream of real earnings associated with currency, like there would be if you think about a stock certificate. There would be a real service flow associated with real money balances. And that's the way Milton Friedman, I think, talked about determining the price level in a paper money system. It depends, however, on being able to control the nominal quantity of money. And the central bank was supposed to be uh, doing that. Uh, but it might require, in order to, uh, for it to work, that the government have some kind of monopoly in the issue of paper money, as well as having discipline over the quantity. Of course, I want to finish with this point about whether paper money, and therefore the price level and inflation rate, is really analogous to thinking about the value of cryptocurrency, such as Bitcoin. Now, a Bitcoin, the Bitcoin system has a very clever mechanism through the blockchain apparatus to control the quantity of Bitcoin, which is like the central bank determining the quantity of paper money and controlling it. So Bitcoin is very attractive in that feature. I think the problem with that system is it doesn't control entry by other producers of cryptocurrency. You can basically enter this market without large costs, and it looks like there are big profit opportunities from int introducing a new form of cryptocurrency. And ultimately, that seems to be the source of the demise of that system. And that's why I think, ultimately, it really is a bubble system, which can't really have real value in the long term. That's what I think. So the question is, is the paper money system that we have analogous to that? Well, it seemed to be working great for a long time, 
particularly after Volcker, for 30 or 40 years, it seems to be functioning great. We seem to have the price stability with low average inflation. Question is, was that a temporary bubble in the same way that I was talking about Bitcoin? And if so, it was great while it lasted. And I'm sorry about finishing on that note. Thank you, Professor Barrow. Παρακαλώ παραμείνετε στις θέσεις σας. Please remain seated. Λήξη τελετής. Αποχώρηση του Πρίτανη, των Αντιπριτάνεων, του Κοσμήτορα, του Προέδρου και των καθηγητών του Τμήματος Οικονομικής Επιστήμης και του καθηγητή Robert Barrow. End of ceremony. The Rector, the Vice Rector, the Dean, the Head of the Department of Economics and Professor Robert Barrow exit the hall. Please proceed to the reception. Ευχαριστούμε πολύ. Καλώς σας βράδυ.